Rob Dole. Topic today: problem of soul, the self, the spirit, the mind, so-called ghost in the machine. The ghost in the machine was a phrase brought. Philosopher called the concept of the mind. Now, perhaps first argued for, although before Descartes capability, the mind like uh, capability being called or um, implication like uh, the soul. Uh, the soul was an idea that began sometime in the 6th century BCE uh, coming out of the East, coming out of India and uh, uh, the Aryan lands, today's uh, Iran, Persian, Persia in uh, Greek times. And the soul had for example, uh, the self, which is a really important one, uh, because we use everyday terms, especially in my work on free will, with the concept of uh, a self. Everything, and that's the position of being a reductionist in which all uh, activity bottom up But uh, it's called causal closure, that there's no room. Cause of nature uh, for event, although no uh, supervenient on and essentially being determinative uh, from below. From up and they're caused uh, from Which is called the self of the mind. Twelve. I guess I need to go uh, zoom in a little. Bit. 
And here I wanted to start off. called this model for the mind, which I have uh, proposed, uh, to, could be called the ego. It is implemented, my model is implemented with this experience recorder and reproducer, or ERR. And the experience recorder is a version of a neuron uh, firing mechanism which causes Uh, but now uh, I wanted to add to that, that neurons that get wired together our recording ability in the neocortex is spectacular and undoubtedly lies behind our so many abilities we have that animals do not have um, uh, basically uh, communicating with one another with languages and so forth and learning that. is just knowledge. It is not just experience. It's also knowledge. It's the, uh, the thing that we do when we are uh, describing our self. One of them, that that decision turns into action uh, by our agent capability. We are agents. Agent is the uh, sort of gerund or participle form of acting. We are acting. We are agents. We are creative agents, and we have the ability to come up with uh, ideas. Happened in our minds. Something happened that allowed us to break causal chains, 
uh, which go back to earlier events, although one could be allowed to describe I will by, for example, the development of a habit uh, which has uh, is able to predict our actions. Many psychologists think that humans are. Uh, quite predictable in many ways uh, concerning the conventional things they do, we do every day. But to make such a prediction based on observation of behavior, which is what um, behavioral psych psychologists like to do, cognitive scientists like to claim they can see the workings in there of some sort of algorithmic computational brain, and it normally uh, is predictable by, by observation, uh, they don't take into account the fact that at any moment we could become completely arbitrary uh, if for no other reason but to prove that the psychologist doesn't know what they're talking about. And we do, in fact, have an ability to break from uh, any, any perceived habit. Now, the idea of a habit goes all the way back to Aristotle. And Aristotle had a very nice way of thinking about how uh, human beings form our character. And this has been a steady story down from Aristotle through the medieval scholastics like Thomas Aquinas. And right down to today in one of the leading philosophers of libertarian free will, uh, Robert Cain. Because Robert Cain uh, wants to trace back uh, some of the free actions we do today, which he calls self-forming actions, back to events in our earlier life experience when we were in a moral uh, torn decision. We were worried about a decision and its moral consequences. Now, while that's interesting, uh, it seems to me it's another example of what most philosophers uh, do who discuss free will. They, in fact, relate it almost 100% to moral responsibility. Now, that's a, that's a difficult situation. and. I will be talking more about that as we distinguish all the different schools uh, having views about free will. Uh, there, are, there's a school who says that uh, free will may not be compatible with determinism, but moral responsibility is compatible with determinism. A very large number, including uh, some of the writers we're going to read today, uh, believe in moral responsibility even though they find no room for anything like a soul or a spirit with a kind of free will and a libertarian ability to act in their own, uh, under their own control. Um, so so uh, back to Bob Kane, he uh, wants to trace the development of character. And he, in this work, he's following Aristotle, uh, who argues that through our lifetime, we have experiences. If those experiences are challenging, in Keynes' mind or in Keynes' model, um, or in Aristotle, if they are somehow significant, uh, they basically put what the ancients and other moderns have called something like a, a, a mark on our, on our souls when they're thinking in those terms. Uh, our character is uh, a way of talking about that. Our character uh, consists of traces, literally uh, some things, Im things embodied in the brain, uh, and therefore a uh, mark of character against ourself and our soul. This is a reasonable way of thinking about everything, uh, and I, I subscribe to this view, but I don't subscribe to the view that it's all happening to us. Uh, neither did Aristotle, and neither did Epicurus, who argued that the thing that breaks away that breaks us away from causal chains and therefore this notion of modern causal closure is um, a swerve of the atoms you remember uh, epicurus has this famous swerve he doesn't understand how it happens when it happens it's not predictable it is a source of randomness and that's a key idea uh, in the forming character then it could be that things happen in our lifetimes and they become a mark on our character it could be, uh, I've always thought it connected to the Indian Eastern idea of karma, 
uh, but it turns out uh, etymologically a deep search into the root of karma. It sure looks like the car of character. Uh, the car of character, the C-H-A-R, is very definitely the car, the char of charcoal. It's like a black mark, uh, unfortunately. Uh, not exactly the best way to think about what we do when we put a trace in our mind of some sort of ancient behavior. And uh, we want to be uh, forming our character, which gives us the tendency or habit to act in ways that we acted in the past that turned out to be uh, good actions. Okay, so coming back to um, Descartes, he, we're basically are saying that... Um, we have this two-stage model of free will. I just wanted to connect to Descartes one more time, and we call it the cogito or cogito. We also are working on a pre presumed uh, argument that there, ir there are objective values in the world that might become a kind of a, um, a basis for uh, bioethics and beyond, a kind of cosmic ethics which we call ergo and associate it with negative entropy as, oppo uh, as opposed to the positive entropy, which is the devil incarnate in one of our dualistic models. And then our model for knowledge we call the sum. So I've used up all the terms in Descartes, and uh, that's the end of my game playing. So the ego is more or less synonymous with the self, the soul or the spirit. Gilbert Ryle called it ghost in the machine. The important thing we are saying about it is that it is immaterial information. Now, an immaterial self with causal power is almost universally denied by modern philosophers as metaphysical. And they also reject our related problematic ideas such as consciousness and libertarian or indeterministic free will. Um, it's quite striking how many... Uh, philosophers are buying into the argument that science has explained so much and it's bound to explain everything. Arguments go along the lines, how can the laws of physics be so powerful controlling the cosmos, the planets are all controlled by laws of nature, uh, so many things are controlled by physics, surely there's no way for us to escape from those laws and if we did, it would be a miracle. And most of these philosophers are rejecting the notion of miracles. Now, I'm okay with rejecting the notion of miracles, but I'm not okay with rejecting the notion that we have, humans have, and to a degree many higher level animals uh, have the ability to do something that was not uh, predetermined because some accident is involved uh, and so forth. And it's an important part of growth. Um, so Descartes, um, I think I had his page somewhere here. Let me see if I do have it. Just take a look here at the information philosopher, show you what I'm doing. By the way, I have recently expanded or altered my home page, for those of you who keep an eye on what I'm doing. Um, so I now have on the home page... Uh, the business about my new social media connections, which I hope some of you will be using. I have here a um, um, animated uh, GIF, which is working through the five uh, subject days. Uh, we're on Friday there in that little image. And here's a picture of my books. And you can click here to get the lecture I gave on describing my studio a little bit for those who are interested in that problem. So I'd like to go is, is to uh, Descartes. Just take a look at his page for a moment. And one of the great things about Descartes, certainly the great thing, is uh, that he had this idea uh, that there were, there were free actions not predetermined. And they weren't predetermined even by, by the, um, the possibility that there was divine foreknowledge. Now, many... Um, See, I've got my ATEM up there so I can come back to this screen. The divine foreknowledge issue was always a stumbling block, but famously the theologians have always explained around it. Uh, the mere fact that God knows what we're going to do with every single, quote, free action doesn't prevent the actions from being free. Well, this is a, a kind of logical dilemma. 
Uh, but Descartes addressed the dilemma and said, it's no problem. Uh, that then became the position of the Catholic Church, which is very interesting, compared to many Protestants who said, look, if uh, God knows what we're doing, we are basically already either elect or we're damned to hell. So uh, they famously went off to demonstrate their elect nature among uh, their fellow believers by doing good works. Uh, it wasn't uh, the idea that by doing good works you get to go to heaven. It's that by doing good works you're showing that you are in fact one of the elect and not one of the damned. Um, this raises an issue which I really uh, don't have much uh, to contribute to the subject, but uh, religions have used the existence of the soul uh, in a very important way uh, because um, the idea that, and the combined idea of, of foreknowledge or present knowledge of uh, a God who's keeping an eye on everybody. I mean, it's an elaboration or an expansion to the line, limits of uh, Santa Claus, you know, uh, keeping an eye and uh, knowing whether you're good or bad or whatever the little line goes out of the Christmas uh, songs, uh, knowing whether you've been good or bad, suggests that you are, you ought to keep an eye on your behavior because someone is watching. Uh, a great friend of mine named Vladimir Dedier, Yugoslav political scientist and great um, internationalist. Uh, Vlado, we called him, was the representative to the forming of the United Nations in San Francisco, uh, representing Yugoslavia in those days, very close to Tito and Milovan Gilas. And Vlado had come to Boston a couple of times and I helped him to get uh, permission to go into the Widener Library and look into some books that he wasn't able to get in Yugoslavia in order to f find uh, more support for his idea that the notion of a god watching in on what you're doing, Vlado thought, originated in the early Egyptian kingdoms, the pharaohs, who came up with the idea that there was just a limit to what the secret police, uh, secret police seems like an uh, anachronistic notion for the pharaoh's uh, security guards and watchers, uh, but, but he was of course writing from a perspective of Eastern Europe, uh, still under the domination uh, indirectly of the Soviet Union, but quite directly by the socialism in one country idea of Tito. And um, the secret police were always uh, only as capable as they could be with the time they had to go around and check on everybody. And so Vlado recognized what an incredible invention it had been for ancient thinkers to come up with the idea that God is watching at all times. And if you do things that you shouldn't do, you'll be paying at your end of days. Uh, the end of days idea was now also only forming in other uh, cultures in those those days. We're talking maybe three, four thousand years BCE, and others were forming the idea, uh, notably one that's always been interesting to me in my study of religions uh, was the Zarathustrians or um, uh, Zoroaster in, a, I think, a European standard version who is either going back to on some accounts 600 BCE or 2000 or earlier than 2000 BCE and that's probably more correct uh, uh, and he was a, a prophet of sorts and had described the uh, rule of gods one of whom gods was a, a, a good god, a positive uh, image god, and the other was a negative. Uh, the positive god was Ahura Mazda. The word Mazda comes down to us as the word for light. We used to have Mazda light bulbs. We now have Mazda cars, which don't have too much to do with the light. And then the negative or satanic version of the dualism, this was a clear dualism in religion, was called Angra Manu, which I always remember as angry man, a sort of uh, easy way to keep him in mind. So Zoroaster or Zarathustra, 2000 years BCE, 
uh, came up with the idea of an end of days that uh, there was when you, when each individual human dies, their soul would be uh, uh, judged in a day of judgment, an individual day of judgment for each individual. And the ancient uh, Avestas, the stories that describe what happens to you at the end of days is that you approach this bridge and you walk out onto this bridge. And I've forgotten its name. It has a Persian name, um, Farsi or whatever, before Iran changed to uh, uh, Islam and Arabic as the main language. Uh, this bridge would, based on your sins, either would be so weighed down that you would be dropped down into a, the original notion of a hell, uh, which came down through the, uh, the countries there, uh, notably Baghdad and Babylon, the Babylon, Babylonian exclusion when Jews went to Babylon. Uh, that's when the idea of heaven and hell entered into the scriptures that Western world knows as the Abrahamic books of uh, of uh, the uh, the Talmud and what so so forth the and the uh, the Christian and and uh, Islamic versions of all of that thinking that idea of your being judged and stepping on a bridge and having it either go down or if you're light because you don't have many sins it tips up and you get to walk up into heaven all of that to give you something of the freight that's involved in this concept of a soul, which is uh, what we have. Let's see if I'm here. Uh, this is my blog post, which I'm putting on the screen and always put up to my iFi blog for you to look ahead of time to see what the lecture is going to be about. You see, we talk here about Descartes. Let me take that to the full screen. And uh, we've read some of that out of chapter 14. Uh, but now, although I was very pleased with the uh, notion from uh, Descartes that uh, his mind or soul or spirit or self or whatever you'd like to describe it was uh, immaterial, this is very significant to me because that's my modern view. It's been rejected by everyone, almost everyone in philosophical and scientific thought who think it's metaphysical, think it um, couldn't possibly exist, and think it's uh, uh, f describing us as being free to act against uh, prior causes and laws of nature and so forth, which I think I hope to convince you of one of these days if you have time for reading all of my arguments in this area. But um, although Descartes was a positive contribution in that regard, even if he was regarded as a failure and is still, uh, he had another idea which was unfortunate, and that was that he thought that um, animals uh, are, are simply machines by comparison with human beings. And he even argued, uh, I'm saying here, included the notion that man too is in part a machine that the human body obeys deterministic causal laws. Uh, and that's a, an understandable position to take, but even that is questionable whether the laws of biology, for example, uh, I do not uh, believe, I don't think, uh, I think I can convince you that much of what goes on in biology involves chance from time to time, very important times, times of creation of new species. The whole idea of mutations in our genetic code, which alter um, a new um, child uh, and so forth, has a, a very large role for chance. And uh, as a side, I will just mention that the neocortex in which we are encoding our experiences with my experience recorder. Uh, the neocortex is quite unusual compared to animals. It's the thing that distinguishes that great big frontal head, frontal lobes area, which are wired in or grow into place at random. What does that mean? It means that every brand new neocortex, which starts growing in the earliest years and doesn't stop growing in all of its connections until maybe a couple decades, uh, that 
young men, especially in their teenage years, it hasn't grown in into the areas of, of serious responsibility. Uh, and so I think we have a model these days of why it is that uh, adolescents and so forth are, are, are still having a lot of trouble deciding what, it, what the limits should be to their behaviors. In any case, um, it's all growing in at random, and what random does is give us new possibilities, right? At the level of our mind, the mind is something that can think of lots of things that have never been thought of before. That's my uh, takeaway. Uh, and what happens is when we have experiences, the experience go in, as Donald Hebb told us, and tend to fuse together at the synapses uh, connections between one neuron or many neurons of that correspond to our sense coming in, our sight, our sound, our smell, and so forth. And it then wires together a group of neurons which form a kind of an association um, uh, that associates all of our sensory input at the time of a, an experience and the emotional uh, feelings that we have at that time, which I believe get wired together also. So now what we have is uh, a mind. Uh, I think Descartes would be happy with this model of a mind because it's basically there and ready to fire again in the future. Hebb has described that uh, neurons that fire together wire together, and I've extended that to thinking what it means for later interpretations of experience or uh, finding meaning in an experience. Uh, when we have a new experience, which has in any way a resemblance to what we've had in our earlier experience, and this becomes true even for the earliest child who's starting to learn and connect things together, the connections are going to be made <clears throat> in the mind with neurons being wired together, and then when something new, a new experience that's something like the older experiences goes into the mind, goes through the brain, of course, but it stimulates uh, those neurons that have been wired together to again fire together. So Hebb says neurons that are wired together fire together. I say neurons that have been wired together will fire together when they're stimulated by any of the connected wired together neurons. And the whole pattern will then fire and be there available to um, to subconscious, stream of consciousness, or below the stream of consciousness, the way William James described it, they will be there to come up to the level of consciousness and help to inform, help to give meaning to the, this current experience. As in, ah, so I've seen that before, I know what that quote means, it's likely to mean that a such and such a consequence will come about. It gives us our our uh, capability for foresight and uh, a number of other important characters, properties. Okay, uh, so backing away from how it is uh, we imagine the mind to work, uh, we come back to Descartes, and what we're saying is, uh, we said earlier, uh, for Descartes, man has a soul or a spirit or a mind that's exempt from determinism and from causal closure. The, the bad part is that Cartesian dualism was a first step to eliminative materialism. Um, and what, what that's telling me is that um, there was an image of the human mind that went back or earlier than Descartes, to, all the way back to the Greeks, in which uh, many thinkers thought that animals had something similar, uh, but just less capable and that the human mind had an ability above and beyond animals, but that they shared some sort of, uh, they called it a uh, sensational, uh, um, whereas uh, the, the uh, mind of man was considered rational and intellectual, and the animal mind was considered sensi sensitive, uh, but not rational. Uh, that got broken which is too bad because it gives you more of a continuity of development ability going down into the animals than Descartes. Descartes made a break. He declared with a modern sensibility that man is just a machine and we're subject to all these laws of nature, which he is studying and contributing to. He's just a short time before Leibniz and, and Newton will develop calculus and uh, 
uh, laws of nature with with nature with uh, Newton, of course. So he's a modern thinker. He's justifiably called the first modern philosopher. And the idea of being modern is to break with the past, and that break unfortunately set up a situation where he thought all animals were um, uh, operating under a causal uh, sequence. And he made an illustration in his book. Let me come back to uh, the, the book version. Uh, he drew this picture, uh, which is called a, a reflex path, a mechanical reflex path, because that's the part of us that are, are, are just machines. And in the picture you see um, the path from a foot feeling pain. So here in this picture there's a little fire going on, and there's, there's a kind of a, a long connecting nerve that goes up to the brain, okay? Uh, and at the top, he, he illustrated this uh, reflex path uh, connecting that nerve to the pineal gland in the mind. Now, the pineal gland was the famous uh, connecting gland which allowed the mind to connect to the uh, brain and material body. So then he draws another um, nerve going back down to pull away the foot. And it's important to note, I say here, that Descartes made that gland the locus of undetermined freedom in humans. He used the term undetermined, and I believe he also used the term immaterial to identify his mind. For Descartes, the body was a deterministic mechanical system of tiny fibers, causing movements in the brain, which were the so-called afferent coming in sensations, which then can, in turn, pull on other fibers to activate the muscles. These are called efferent going out, exferent uh, out moving nerve impulses. And this is the basis of stimulus and response theory in modern psych physiology. It's called reflexology. And it's also the basis behind civil connectionist theories of the mind, that somehow there's up, uh, up here in the brain, everything that's going on are just a whole bunch of connections. and. Uh, the, the, the idea of neural networks, which is very important today with logical connections, uh, need only connect the afferent, the incoming, to the efferent, outgoing signals. No thinking mind is needed for animals, and of course some extend that to uh, human beings. It's called the reflex arc model, and it's still common in biology. Okay. I'd like to focus, I guess, uh, but let's take it back to this section. Um, we mentioned his model of undetermined freedom in my model because our immaterial thoughts are free, whereas our actions are adequately determined, and that's a different type of, uh, of determinism from uh, Descartes. So we are self-determined. Um, the self is often identified with one's character, and this is the basis for saying that our choices and decisions are made by evaluating freely generated alternative possibilities in accordance with our reasons, motives, feelings, desires, etc. And these, of course, have been built up from our past experiences. So let's um, jump into a couple of writers that I have on my website who I, uh, I think are kind of representative of this problem of the soul, as I called our talk today. And I'm going to um, take a look down at this book, put it aside, and bring in a couple of other books. One by a, a religious believer, Richard Swinburne, who thinks he can understand the soul and tries to understand it in modern ways with this very long book. And then um, Owen Flanagan's Problem of the Soul, very popular book. Um, and I have a web page on Owen Flanagan somewhere here. Let's see if I can bring it up. Here's my web page on Flanagan. And we may get into some of the detail on him in a moment to see how he gives us this argument about um, about the uh, problem of the soul. Let me just first quote a little bit from Richard Swinburne. And I need to get in close for that. So 
here is this point that I think Swinburne made pretty well about the animals. Uh, here, Swinburne said, in his sense, animals have souls. Uh, talk about animal souls as well as human souls was normal in Greek philosophy, he said. I think that's right. In medieval Christian thought, the idea of a very sharp division between animals who had no souls and men who had souls arrived in the 17th century with Descartes and his strange view that animals were unconscious automata, machines in other words. Our experience is against that strange view. The difference between animals and men, as the medievals well recognized, was not that men had a mental life and so souls and animals did not, but that man had a special kind of mental life, mental capacities which went beyond those of animals, and so a special kind of soul. The medievals called this soul the rational or intellectual soul, so we humans have an intellect as opposed to the animal or sensitive soul. So that was the point we just made. So the Swinburne book uh, goes on and on, and it's an enormously long book, uh, but he basically has a, a, a strong uh, record of the history on this title, The Evolution of the Soul. So let's switch over to uh, the, the problem of the soul, which uh, Flanagan describes in a subtitle as two divisions of, mi of mind and how to reconcile them. So the key idea for uh, the two division people, ah, it's interesting, I see this is dedicated to Francisco Varela and Alistair McIntyre, two rather important thinkers. He has a chapter on free will, which is the principal thing I studied him about in order to put on his webpage. But today I want to think about this notion of what, it, what a soul could be in Flanagan's thinking. Um, and what Flanagan does, let's see if I can, uh, no, I can't bring that up to the other screen. Um, I'll go there just for a moment, set where I'm going with this, and someday I'll bring in the ability to put the book on this screen. I don't have my studio built with that capability yet, but I'm still building it all the time. Um, what, when Flanagan says two visions, what he's thinking is the famous two visions of, uh, who was it, uh, Robert Blake, who said famously in his, I uh, can't remember the name of the poem, but uh, he said, uh, twofold always may God us keep from single vision and Newton's sleep. From Blake, he felt, he felt that scientists, and Newton was the, the, the one who did the most damage, had found a completely mechanical, deterministic, uh, reductionist, although that's a more modern term, reducing man to a machine. Uh, and Descartes, although he didn't want to do that, he made man special and different from the animals to whom Blake sees were obviously just the current sort of highest form uh, with our abilities going beyond that of any animal, primarily because of language, communications, and use of information in a way that no animal uh, can do but, but very tiny amounts of communicating information like a bee signaling where the flowers are or uh, ants laying down a trail so they can find the food and so forth. Uh, man can do so much of that indirect of the immediate physical surroundings and even of the current time. That is to say, I can give this lecture and I can write a book that led to this lecture or a web page about Owen Flanagan that I wrote a few years ago that will be there and readable by people 10, 20 years from now. If I can get my son and others who may work on this, uh, keep the website alive indefinitely somehow. Uh, so humans have these abilities, but they are not necessarily um, complete, discontinuous, de novo humans, which many, many thinkers would like to believe because they'd like to believe the animals are just so many more uh, natural things and man has uh, a control over nature uh, and that we're different somehow. So I think that's what uh, Owen Flanagan is saying. 
His first sentence is, this book is about the conflict between two grand images, okay? I hope you can read that, um, of, of who we are. He calls it the humanistic and the scientific. Now, there are many people who have described this dualism through the ages. This is uh, Flanagan's term for what um, Wilfred Sellers, who was uh, Robert Kane's thesis advisor, uh, and Sellers assigned Kane to think about free will, he called it the scientific image and the um, manifest image, which was a, just his choice of word, but it suggested there was something very much otherwise going on. And the humanistic image, or Sellers' manifest image, says that we are spiritual beings endowed with free will, a capacity that no ordinary animal possesses. Ouch. Let's take that for a moment. Again, what justifies Flanagan is saying it's a complete break that free will enters with humans. Animals don't have free will. That's part of the Descartes, the Cartesian problem. Descartes said the human is the one who has the mind, the immaterial mind and the ability to uh, do things that are immaterial. Uh, I don't believe that's a reasonable break point. There's plenty else to say why we're uh, very special and different from animals, but it isn't, in my mind, worth saying that uh, we have the free will because it makes it a little harder to defend. So he says, free will, a capacity that no ordinary animal possesses and that permits us to circumvent ordinary laws of cause and effect. Okay. Flanagan is in real trouble right there, but you see he represents a modern group of thinkers who call themselves naturalists, who believe that the laws of nature are, in fact, binding us as well as all animals. And you can't make a case for a special uh, ability of humans. Um, so my approach to that division, which is arbitrary, is to say, well, not only do we have free will, it in no way uh, uh, breaks any laws of nature, that there are plenty of uh, degrees of freedom plenty of opportunities for some chance to enter that breaks the causal chains from the past and allows new information to come into the universe. And that new information might come in in the form of new ideas because humans are creative and they have free will. And when we go back down towards the animals, like to quote a 20th century philosopher up the main idea this way when we act freely we exercise quote a prerogative which some would attribute only to god each of us when we act is a prime mover unmoved in doing what we do we cause certain things to happen and nothing or no one causes us to cause those events. The are animals that evolved according to the principles of natural selection. Although we are extraordinary animals, we possess no capacity that permits us to circumvent the laws of cause and effect. The question is this, which is it? The two images, at least as depicted in these terms, are incompatible. The answer can't be both, or if it is, there's a lot of explaining to do. Well, I'm ready to start doing some of that explaining uh, because there are many uh, detailed understanding of uh, whether laws of cause and effect are absolute laws so that every single event is caused by a prior event back infinitum to the prime mover unmoved which is a logical problem, if you like. Uh, some thought that meant the universe must have been infinitely old because the causal chain would then go back indefinitely forever. Um,
because um, we'll be sorry. group Autos. We, uh, if you look back to his page, if you'd like to see that very interesting insight, that uh, no two individuals have exactly. Knew that there were some ideas which, uh, by common agreement among a community, a culture, to assign a meaning which we all agree. We hope that if, especially exposed to new ideas and uh, able to learn them before they've been drilled into with rote learning and especially rules of, of life that says that your culture, a particular culture, is deathly enemy with another culture and the two have to fight it to the death and so forth. And coming back to the soul, uh, many societies have taken advantage of this invention of the soul, uh, which Swinburne describes. But if you take it back to the earliest notion of what the soul did, the uh, powers that be the idea that uh, that soul is immortal and it needs to be defended in order to ap appreciate or get the immortal uh, soul up the bridge uh, at the day of judgment in the uh, old uh, Aryan religion. Uh, otherwise you're going to be condemned to life of pain forever. That clearly is an enormous motivator and uh, can be very uh, badly, in my opinion, used by a society that wants to uh, indoctrinate beliefs that force the entire society into a single vision of what, what's good, what's bad, what's going to be not only punished, what behaviors would not only be punished, but will be punished eternally. Um, 
It's a very powerful idea. It's perhaps in some ways the most powerful single idea ever invented because it has the ability to do what the, th the secret police, the thought police cannot do, as my friend Blatto put it, uh, because the idea has now implanted motivation, rewards and punishments, which are with each individual in that culture from the time they realize what those rules are to the time they die. And you have, as a government now, achieved a control over your population uh, that's beyond anything that an army can do, uh, a military police can do, or a secret police can do. Uh, and that is, could be for good or bad. Uh, definitely, I shouldn't be so negative. There are many people, many founders of such belief systems who argue relatively persuasively that these, um, not just uh, habits, but these moral rules of, of behavior uh, with backed up by the threat of eternal punishment or eternal reward. It's not just a stick, but it's a lollipop or whatever. It's a Christmas present from Santa. Um, that gives people a life to live by that could wind up being a more um, stable life. Um, these you know, fixed societies tend to be pretty stable uh, because when you go back to the law of nature, you go back to the Hobbesian jungle, or you go back to what uh, uh, can be described as uh, dog eat dog rather than man negotiating with other humans, uh, that uh, is a, na a very can be a worrisome situation for those of us in our society who are responsible for trying to keep law and order and keep reasonable behavior uh, as the rule of the day. So. Um, the problem of the soul, as um, Owen Flanagan has seen it, uh, is, is a very important issue. Uh, we'll come back and just quickly look at his page here. Uh, and I say that uh, he, he quoted Roderick Chisholm and as, as someone who believes in agent causation. And I mentioned that's why I wanted to quote that line about Chisholm. Roderick Chisholm was at Brown when I was at Brown, and he was well spoken of as one of the great philosophers, uh, certainly at Brown University. And he was behind the idea that we are agents, that we can be responsible for our ag actions as agents, and we could be causing things to happen in the world. I'm sad to say that um, uh, Chisholm is sort of out of fashion because today's thinkers are more interested in um, the issue of uh, natural law explaining everything and uh, that we are simply um, agent, uh, not agents but passive uh, persons who are um, being controlled by forces uh, outside of ourselves. I'm working on a description of that notion of how an immaterial mind does the control uh, in biology when information management of the food supply going through biological organisms comes on up to where humans use our information structures to manage the flow of matter and energy through our bodies, which is one of my themes, so that uh, clearly uh, we are in charge, uh, not um, not laws of nature, especially not laws of deterministic nature. So with that, I think I will sign off and say goodbye until tomorrow. And I'm now putting up a poster board at the front and the end of the lecture so as to make editing the, um, the uh, easier.